Cedar Beach Bible Church, welcome to this morning's day. Great to have everybody here this morning. Y'all are looking great. You sounded great here in this direction. So we just uh, thank you. Thanks for everybody for being here. So the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, joints and the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As Hebrews 4 12, 2 Timothy 3 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in the righteousness. Number one, what is ready? What is it? I mean, if you were to ask a lot of people to define it, you would probably come up with a thousand different answers. Does anybody ever really understand what ready is? What is ready? And number two is that we have to know that what we believe will happen tomorrow will happen so that we can take the appropriate action and do what we need to do today. If, we don't, if we're not ready for what happens tomorrow, we don't know what to do to be ready for what we are doing today. So, it sounds like a really easy thing to do, right? Like, ooh, easy peasy, right? Yeah. Easy, we might think it's easy, but it's not. In, in fact, it's, it's really kind of complicated. When Jesus was telling a certain parable, we were going to the parable, but, but he ended with this question, he ended this parable with this question. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, if it wasn't a little bit complicated to be ready, if we really understood what that meant, and we were always ready, just always be ready, would even Jesus need to make a comment like this? You know, well, will I even find anything? Will I find faith when I come? Will there be any? He wouldn't ask this question unless it was important. So we know it's complicated, it's a little bit difficult. Um, and there's no doubt, I mean, Jesus, Jesus wants us to live in a state of readiness. There's absolutely no doubt. I mean, there's many passages in God's Word that, that, that's going to that point that out. We'll take a look at just one. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord will come. But know this, that if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have let his house be broken into. Right? For any of you guys that have been in that situation, he wouldn't have went to dinner. <laughs> you'd have stayed home. Yeah, you'd have been forwarding that. That's right. You'd have been ready for it. It says, therefore, you must also be ready for in an hour when you least expect the Son of Man is coming. I remember my very, very first real job interview. I always did you know, mow yards and all that kind of stuff. My very first job interview, I was, I was applying to be a bag boy at the local supermarket, right? And my best friend, he already had a job there. He was, he was already gainfully employed, you know, throwing stuff in the sack. Uh, and, he, and he told me, he said, look, they really need help. You know, they actually told me to go out and find people to come in, you know, that could interview for, for you know, a, a position here. Um, and, and he also said, look, I'll put in a good word for you. You know, I mean, you're a good guy. And, you know, I thought to myself, like, well, you have all my extremities, they're all intact, and I can complete a sentence. <laughs> I mean, listen, it was a sure thing. I, it was a sure thing. I was gonna, I, you know, there was no way I wasn't going to get this job. And all I had to do was complete the application. Simple, right? And, and I had to take a bagging test, which shouldn't be that tough, right? And, and, I, had to, and I had to answer four questions without spitting on the manager. This, these, this is all this job requirement was, you know, that's all it required. I was terrified. <laughs> I was, I was, I was terrified. I, I just knew I was going to screw up the unscrewable. It, it, it was no doubt in my mind. And, and it wasn't that I wasn't ready. I mean, I knew the questions in advance. You know, I could have even practiced putting cans in a bag. You know, I mean, how hard is it to, to do that, to put a couple cans in a bag? It was not that difficult. And I even knew the questions. I knew what he was going to ask me. I was, you know, practicing in front of the mirror. For a bad job. <laughs> I mean, this is it, it, funny. I don't care. And this is the closest I've ever been to peeing in my pants as an adult. I'm not that old yet. Okay, so. As an adolescent, this angst 
but it's not because I wasn't ready, right? It's just I had no confidence in my readiness. I had absolutely no confidence in readiness. You know, I, I was trying to convince myself, dude, you got this. Doing all the self-talk stuff that I didn't realize was what you know, psychologists will tell you way in the future. You just talk to yourself. Get yourself through it. I was doing that before I even knew what that was. You know, you'll be fine. How hard can it be? And I was still, I was, I was just terrified that, that I wasn't going to get it. You know, I didn't know why. Because I wasn't confident in my residence. Ready. So here, here's the problem for us. Confidence is a commodity. I mean, psychology will tell us um, that most people don't possess this commodity. In fact, very, very few people possess this commodity. There's a, uh, a psychologist named Thomas Rutledge. Um, he's a, a resident professor at the University of California, and he's a staff psychologist at the Veterans Administration in San Diego. And, and he says this, he says, authority figures have taught us that confidence comes from these things, okay? Uh, having successful experiences helps you with confidence. Achieving accolades, which helps you with your confidence. Obtaining expertise about the thing that you want to be confident in. You know, being an expert at whatever thing that you're wanting to find confidence in. And from support and encouragement from others. When in reality, None of those things are true. In the psychology, for, the, for the, the regular jail on the street, none of these things are true at all. In fact, in life, it's kind of backwards. And when we talk about a life in Christ, it's completely backwards. In fact, it gets so wrong that when people have had many accolades and, and accomplishments, it, it's been shown that it seldom translates into immature confidence. What they continue to try to do is they just, you know, they may have all the accomplishments and accolades in the world, they just keep trying to get more. You got quarterbacks that won't retire because they don't have enough trophies. You know, it, it, those things are, it, it actually has a name, okay? It actually has a name. It, it's called imposter syndrome. What they convince themselves of is that, you know, well, that person that I see is being very successful and it has all these accolades, accolades and that's not me. No, that's, that's the imposter that I've become because inside I am completely in, inconfident and not ready. I have to, every time that I go out to do whatever this is that I'm supposedly an expert at, I'm having to jazz myself up. I'm having to really, you know, get my, you know, pull myself up by the bootstraps to get myself out there to do these things. They have zero confidence. So, to be truly ready, we have to be confident about our readiness. If we're not confident about our readiness, we are not going to ever have that happen. Now, we've talked about where confidence doesn't come from, but let's, let's look at some definitions. And again, this is for clinical psychology. We're going, to, we're going to approach this at, you know, as someone who's listening to a clinical psychologist, and then we're going, to, we're going to see if we can pull some truth out of these things that will speak to us today as, as Christians. So let's take a look at the graph. All right. So uh, now remember, these, these are definitions from clinical psychology. This isn't, you know, we're going to talk about the, the parallels that we find in the Bible. This is from clinical psychology. So I love this very first definition. Well, confidence is not something that comes from the grid. Grid, did it? Easy for you to say. Credentials, awards, and experience, right? And what confidence really is, is a skill that you can develop or enhance. Now, I love this first one. And in 1 Peter 3.15 says this. It says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to every man who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and fear. We were supposed to always be ready to do that. Always be ready. But if we don't have confidence in our readiness, how can we be ready to do that? How can that work for us? I mean, Jesus calls us to be fishers of men, not watchers of men. Okay, so we, we, we can't, like, stand around and go, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll just, you know, I, I know that person needs to hear about Jesus, and I, I know it would be really important for them to hear about all this way around from somebody else with a little more experience, a little more Bible knowledge, can come along and 
you know, they'll be the person that helps that. You know what? I think I'll probably just wait a while. They're pretty rough. Those are some rough folks. So I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit soften them up a bit first. You know, I, I don't want to be the first one in in, in that battle. I'll just let him go ahead and soften us up. Soften our, our target up there a little bit. Um, that's not the way it works. So when you, when you think about it, and you look through God's Word, God never chose titles. He created them. He created titles. He made a shepherd boy a king. He made a stutterer a spokesperson. He made a bunch of fishermen change the world. And he, uh, the chief persecutor, he made the chief evangelist. God was not looking for titles. He's not looking for accolades. He's not looking for experts on anything. God doesn't need some flashy theologian with a PhD in New, New Testament studies. Doesn't need that. It's not what he's looking for. He needs a willing vessel. That's what he needs. A willing vessel. In fact, the less qualified you are, the better it is. You know why? Because then God gets the glory. Amen. So, if you're sitting here this morning feeling a little less qualified, pat, pat yourself on the back. Just go ahead and do it because that's exactly what God's looking for. Thank, and thank you for doing it. There you go. <laughs> Amen. All right. Second, something that guarantees success. What it really is is something that enables your best efforts. Listen, confidence doesn't guarantee success. It does not. I mean, we look at, you know, lots of things, especially right now in the world, you know, the most confident people, sometimes the biggest failures we've ever seen. It just allows us, confidence just allows us to put the best foot forward. It allows us to make sure that we're doing Look, everybody in here has a story. Y'all, everybody that, I mean, you can be confident in your own story, right? You've lived it. You're an expert that you're on the story. Someone needs to hear your story. Someone needs to hear your story. Everybody has one. God will put us exactly where he needs us to tell our story. Because the person we are telling our story is the exact person that God's put in our path to hear that very story. And besides, listen, God, God's word promise us, promises us faithful that the Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting in the Right? You just you just need to you just need to be confident in the fact that my story means something to somebody. I just have maybe I can go through a hundred people before I find that person, but I'm gonna find them. You know, I'm gonna figure out who it is. Now listen, again, God's word it very, very much points out to, to us that He He doesn't always ask people to do things that seem successful. We were talking about this a little bit in the men's uh, the men's group. I mean, Noah preached for a hundred years, and he took eight people on the ark. Right. And some of those people may have just been along as a as the family got included, because we know some things happened afterward. But we're not really sure they should have been on there. I mean, Jeremiah preached for seventy years, and Israel didn't listen. Didn't listen. So, if on, on the surface you can say, you know what? Neither one of those two guys had any success. They were failures. Except, we find them in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the heroes of the faith. So what we perceive as failure, God perceives as heroes. They were capes on. They had their capes on. Being laughed at, insulted, and pushed aside, believe it or not, the Bible tells us is a blessing. If you are reproached because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Wow, that is a backwards economy, is it not? <laughs> but that's okay. Listen, this is, this is how we should think about it. You know, it seems backwards to us. It seems a little weird. It seems like, well, how can that actually be? Um, see, if we change our core belief system, 
we change the way we think about confidence, if we change the way we think about readiness, I mean, that's actually the secret sauce of confidence. That's what actually adds to it. And, and, and when this happens, you get to add to the blessing bar. Okay, and then this noise overcomes the noise. Our blessings, when we do these things, overcomes any way that anybody's going to act toward us. It overcomes any way, it overcomes any fear that we're going to have that, that what the response is going to be. Rejection? I'm going to add a coin. You know, ridicule? Coin. If my Lord is blasphemed because of something I said, it was truth. Coin. And what I do. What I've done is Him the glory. Even if it looks like it failed, even if we didn't get the idea that we had going into it, that, if that's not what happened, point in the jar. Point in the jar. If this noise begins to overwhelm, our jar noise begins to overwhelm the world's noise, then we have a paradigm shift within ourselves because, wait a minute, all of that psychology stuff that I've been taught all these years, or, you know, that I've been, I've been under, I've been over-programmed with, begins to fade, and we start to be able to understand the psychology of Christ or the psychology of God. And that is what we need to do. So let's go back to our definition slide for a second. And the next one should be an um, easy one for all of us. It's, it's, it's something that spontaneously occurs later in life. That's what it is not. It's something that you can develop whenever you commit to the process. Now again, this is psychology, but we can use that to take a look. So let's, this one should be easy. This one should be easy for most of us. If, if, we're, if we were to consider our life as a one-mile race, I mean, Paul tells us, you know, run the race, run the race. So let's for a second consider ourselves in a one-mile race. Most of us in the room this morning are in the final lap. You know, we're hopefully you know, we're running out of, uh, we're running out of track. And we have or haven't accomplished something. We have or haven't accomplished what God's purpose is for us. We don't want to run out of track. We want to be sure that we accomplish if we don't have, if we're not ready, we don't have confidence that we're ready, you know, that's not a good race. That's not the kind of race we want. We're not even on the right track. In a large house, there are not only good and silver, gold and silver vessels, but also those of good and clay. Some are for honor and some are for dishonor. One who cleanses himself from these things will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, fit for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Part of what we went before this is that, you know, it's talking about our salvation, all the things that we would be cleansed from if we came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want, you to, I want you to pay particular attention to these verses. And notice that it doesn't say, you know what, if you're cleansed in your early 20s, then you're fit. You can't find that, right? It also does not say that there's some kind of apprentice program. Well, you need to work up to be fit, okay? You know, you need to study and spend some time under somebody who appears to be fit so that you can be fit. It does not say that to us at all. Okay? Cleansed equals fit. There's no delineation. I does not say, no, there's, you know, there's nothing else going on. Cleansed equals fit. So if God's word says that you're fit, then it's nothing short of disobedience to wait on being the vessel that you think you need to be to be fit. It's just disobedience. So, this next definition is, what confidence is not? Something that's supposed to just appear when you finally deserve it. What confidence is? Something that rarely happens unless you take responsibility to create it, right? Um, this definition, I hope, is, is an easier one for us. Because, you know, if, if you really are in Christ, you should understand it. That um, and it should help us move towards confidence, right? We deserve nothing for our judgment. We deserve and nobody in this room. I mean, if you're in or out of Christ, you deserve nothing short of judgment. 
And, and we talked about this last week in a sermon. Our worthiness is only there because of Christ's worthiness. The only reason that we're worthy. And if we're waiting on ourselves to be worthy, holy cow, we have a long way to. It'll be a long, long way. First Corinthians 10 31 says this. It says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. All of it. So even if it all clicks for us and if we're just serving away as this perfect red vessel right in the middle of God's will, perfect, everything's going perfect, God's will, it's, it's not for our glory, it's for His. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to Him. Well, even if we're doing that in perfection, what we have to understand is that you know, the accolades that this is talking about or, or, or any of that confidence that this is saying that we could have or any of that stuff doesn't belong to us in the first place at all is for the glory of God. So listen, there, there's no perfect moment. There's not going to be some aligning of the universe that all of a sudden, you know, some magic fairy dust falls on your head and poof, I'm fit, I'm ready. It doesn't happen that way. That's not... What God's intent is. It all comes to Christ. All of us comes to Jesus. And finally, what confidence is not? Support and success are the causes of confidence. Okay? Support and success are often the result, not the cause of confidence. Um, have you ever known anyone to provide support for someone who lacks confidence unless they're a mom or a paid therapist? I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen. You know, unless you've had just this unbelievable empath, you just can't keep from like trying to fix everybody. This doesn't happen. Support doesn't happen that way. It actually happens exactly opposite. It's like we tend to start getting support when we become ready, when we become fit, when we're starting to show those things to happen. I've watched a bunch of interviews where interviews talk to this person who's highly successful. And I'm sure you've probably seen some of these too. And I've never once heard them say, yeah, you know, I was I was walking down that alley and I tripped over I tripped over a good business idea. And then the following Saturday after my nap, I decided to throw some stuff together and boom, business success. <laughs> Unbelievable success, right? And normally, when you talk, those people are, are they're overconfident. It's like, well, you know, after my fifth bankruptcy, I finally figured it out. And I got it right. They're usually exactly opposite of what we would think. You know, it's like, oh, they're over. But that's not the way it happens. It's hard work. It's sweat equity. It is all of those things. And there are failures in almost everybody's story who's successful over and over and over and over. And even the most successful people that we see on the planet today are still failing at stuff. But you know what? They keep swinging. And they keep, they, every time a pitch comes, they're swinging at it. They hit some, they miss some. They've got to over the fact that they failure means anything. It's a learning experience. It's something that we can understand. Luckily for us, there's no bankruptcy in the game. Right? It doesn't happen that way. So we, you know, we don't have to worry about filling out any paperwork. We just go to the next step. Let us go to the It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The excellency of the power being from God and not from ourselves. So we have confidence in the things and the works and all of the stuff that we do because we know that the power doesn't come from us. It comes from God. That's where all of it comes from. We're just a vessel. If you're trying to be anything but a vessel, you're overworking yourself. I mean, you're, it's, it's, it, that's a sure sign that things are going to fail. And if, if, no matter what it is, if whatever is flowing through you originates from God, you can't screw it up. You can't be like, I thought I was going to mess up that job. Not going to happen. Matthew 6, 20 and 21 says this. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Let me, I want you to listen to this statement. 
There is no better investment program ever instituted than being able to use someone else's unlimited resources to build your portfolio. If you are allowing the power of God to flow through you as a willing vessel, then anything and everything that happens, he gets the glory, but guess what you are doing? You are building your portfolio in heaven as your treasure. <laughs> Using God's resources to build your future. That is exactly what it translates to. Amen? It is. But listen, God's word, it holds many, many admonitions about confidence. Talks about it a lot. And our Lord doesn't want us to be willy-nilly. He doesn't want us to be afraid to say stuff to people. He doesn't want us to be waiting for that fairy dust to fall out of the sky to anoint you into fitness. Remember, when Stephen was fit, you are ready right now. Right now. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us then come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. If you're in Christ this morning, you had to have the confidence in him that he could save you. You had to have a beginning confidence in him that you, so that you could understand that you couldn't save yourself. You had to have confidence in him to understand the promises that God gives us in the word, that if you repented and you turned from your sin, that you would become a child of God. You had to have that confidence or it didn't happen. If you didn't have that confidence to make that decision and make that choice and walk into that, then it didn't happen. So what we see in this is we become partakers of Christ that we hold to the beginning of our confidence. That confidence that you showed when you accepted Jesus the first time, what happened to it? What happens to it? The noise. The noise out there. I mean, let me tell you, that, I mean, that takes a grand amount of confidence for us to take that step of faith and say, yes, Lord, I believe in you. I believe that the Lord did exactly, that God did exactly, raised you on the third day. I believe that I turned from my sin repent, that I can become a child of God, that takes an amazing amount of confidence to take that step. He wants us to keep that throughout. We have to remain steadfast. We have to remain immovable. Always striving to be that willing vessel. That's what he's looking for. And when we stumble, if we stumble, you know, probably not if we stumble. When we stumble, that will happen. When we stumble, we approach the throne of grace with confidence. You know, I mean, how many people, you know, when I messed up, I'm afraid to go before the Lord. You never, you approach with confidence and say, Lord, you I messed up. It's horrible. I cannot believe I did that. Forgive me and help me to do better the next time. That's confidence. Saying, then believing with the same confidence that you had when you came to Christ, that He is willing and able to wipe away all unrighteousness because he is. Practical thoughts. What, what can help us be more confident in our approach to being ready? What are some things that we might be able to do? Outcomes can't be fully controlled. You can't control any outcomes. It doesn't make any difference what you're talking about. You know, this is, you know, life is a crapshoot. You know, sometimes it's going to go in a good direction, sometimes it's going to go in a bad direction, and you can control absolutely none of it. But what matters to God isn't the result, right? What matters is the effort, the persistence, the preparation, and the goals that you set. I mean, how many people have goals to talk to X amount of people that are reading about Jesus? I'm going to talk to two people this week about Jesus. 
if I have to hold them there on the beach. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of people start coming home from the beach with sandy bags. <laughs> How many? I mean, we should be set the ball. I'm going to talk, you know, this week, this week, very beginning of the week, I'm going to make my weekly plan. I'm going to sit down, you know what, I've got this friend. I've got this friend, I know that he's apart from Christ. I'm going to make every effort to talk. I'm going to set a goal to talk to him about Jesus this week. And we said, well, these, this is what's important to God is, is, is how our effort, our persistence, and the, and the goals that we set for doing what he's commanded us to do. And these are all attributes that are aligned with the confidence in God's power. If you're confident in God's power, then I don't care who's on your list. I'm going to do it because it's not me. It's God's power. It's not my power or my words. It's God's power and God's words. Second, Success is a process. Okay? It, it, it's not something that just happens overnight. So what we have to do is when we see setbacks or we see hardships come about, understand that that's part of the process. And for the Christian, the hardest thing to remember is that setbacks and hardships, as well as, as all of the success that we might see, they're all part of the treasure. They're all part of the treasure. It's all part of the thing. Clinking in the jar. All of those things. Hardships, setbacks, and, and, and they all give God glory. Even the worst thing, things that can happen. Third, we understand that the ultimate success is already assured. The end is already sealed. It is absolutely 100% guaranteed. It's like the only thing in this life that's guaranteed is what happens in the end. Everything else, you know, we don't know. We can't control. One thing that we can grab a hold of is that I know for sure this is what's going to happen, and that is what I am told in the Bible what happened to me. We can have confidence in that because God is sovereign. And no part of his purpose is subject to failure. It's not. But if it looks like failure, remember Noah and Jeremiah? Even if it looks like failure, it's not failure. God can use even the most disastrous appearing outcomes for his glory. We've got, we've got people that live that, that live through that in this church, in this very church. Terrible outcomes, but... It is, it is turned around with God's glory. He can use anything for his glory. Fourth, we look for the teaching inside any success or failure. I mean, what's there? What, what, what is it? What, confidently approach all outcomes with questions. God, what do you want me to see? Your path is a stinker. That, that worked. That was, that was bad. What do you want me to see in that? Because there's something in there. There's something that's a teaching. There's something that God is trying to show us in all those stinkers. Every single solitary word. Everything we do. If we are the willing vessel and the power of God is flowing through us, everything we do has a silver lining. Every single thing. And we have to change our thinking to align with that truth. That's very, very important. Fifth, we understand that, you know, it's going to happen. We begin to get nervous or anxious or doubtful in our confidence that we absolutely can, absolutely can go with confidence before the throne. You know, I don't know why I work, but man, this, this thing I put on my goal list for this week, this person that I said I was going to talk to, you know, I'm, just, I'm anxious about this. I don't know why. I, I don't know what it is, but I know that it's you in the first place, and I know that the stuff, if I let the stuff flow through me, but I can't fail, I get all that, I'm confident of that, and yet, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious, scared, anxious, doesn't matter. Approach the Lord with confidence. I mean, this is the love of our Lord showing through. Give us more confidence in Him. So we can approach Him when we feel a little underconfident. Or something is like really holding us back from being normal. And lastly, lastly, whatever we endeavor to do as a vessel for God, 
We never ever ever take rejection or failure personally. Our humanness, that's one of the most difficult things for us to accomplish, but it's paramount because taking those things personally is a death sentence for your confidence. I've already heard that God can make any mess, any mess he can make a miracle. Any failure, he can make fantastic. And any trouble, he can make a teaching. And we have to make that part of our thought process. It has to be at the front of our mind in all the things that we do when we're walking out of Christian. Listen, confidence isn't a feeling. It's not. It, you know, it, it, it's a skill that you develop being dependent on it not being about you. And it's a skill. It's not easy to do. We have to always take it back and give it back to who it belongs to in the first place. My confidence is in Jesus Christ. Period. If you haven't taken that first step of confidence we talk about, that first step of confidence, we haven't taken that. And God's word has something to say about that, right? For he says, in an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. So whether you are taking your first step into confidence or your next step into confidence, today is the day. This is it. Let's pray.